Welcome. You have entered the realm of 1111 Talk Radio. Your host is Simron. It's time to discover your own language with the universe. Empower yourself, broaden your mind, open your heart, and discover who you are. Now, here's your host, Simron. Hello, happy Halloween and blessed Semaine. We are here today in all of our aliveness, and we are going to be talking about a different version of aliveness today. In my recent trilogy of Living, Being, and Knowing, I discuss in the book Living, The Blessing of Death. It is the seventh part of a cycle that we continuously repeat. And in that book, I'm talking more about the continuous deaths that we experience within life. But at the end of life, that is the final blessing that we have as we leave our bodies. This correlates in the book Being to the illusion of war. And with the illusion of war, that's the fight that we have internally or externally. It's also the resistance that the soul has to the body and the human experience and its desire to embrace its oneness back into the allness that we are. And then the blessing of death, the illusion of war, correlate with the grace of freedom in the third book, Knowing. And it's really, really powerful to consider this, particularly with the topic that we're going to talk about today, and also in regard to where I've been in my life, because I have two aging parents, both very near 90, and they are quite compromised. They are in these end stages, and books often come my way as a sign, a symbol, as a conversation with the universe, as I often talk about. And today we are going to be talking about death nesting. And that may be something that you've never heard of. We often hear about birth doulas. We often hear about nesting as we're preparing for a new child, a new life, nesting in a new in a home, nesting in even our own workplaces. But rarely do we ever hear that there might be the need for a death doula. Death nesting is about preparing for the nest for one who is dying, just as we might prepare a nest for one who is about to give birth. Some individuals begin nesting before or during pregnancy in preparation for that birth so that environments feel safe and orderly and ready and spacious, and that also opens the way for internal work to begin. And as I've watched my own parents move through their processes, I can see a lot of what is going on that my guest, Anne-Marie Capel, is sharing with us today. She's a lifelong meditator, a death doula educator. She's trained with hands-on experience in home funerals and green burials. She is the founder of a nonprofit, Village Death Care. And her work has a foundation in nurse assistant and hospice training, along with her caring for an elderly homeless man, which led her to teaching about death care. She is an advisor to a virtual reality therapeutics company and emulates the benefits of psychedelic assisted therapy to those working through end of life. Her work as a death doula has been published nationally in the Washington Times, on usnews.com, and in Pulp Magazine. And so this will be a very intimate, poignant, and also quite relevant and important conversation that we have to have in preparation for so much that's been going on and will continue to go on, but also in consideration to our own lives. And so sit back, relax, take a deep breath, and just listen. Let yourself center into this heart-centered practice of a death doula. Welcome, Anne-Marie, to 1111 Talk Radio. Simran, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Well, this is um, an interesting book to be talking about, and it's also quite synchronistic that we are doing this on this particular day because the veils are even thinner. And I think that the biggest fear that human beings have, and I think this has been said throughout time, is the fear of death. And I would say alongside that goes the fear of aging and all that comes with it, 
especially as of what we've seen in the past few years, that can make the end stages of life quite difficult or challenging for some. And so this type of work is something that most people would never even consider exist. And I don't know that I ever even heard of a death doula before I got your book. Talk a little bit about this type of work and what the distinctions are, if any, from that of a birth doula. Ah, uh, so see, the thing is, is that um, death doulas have always been around, just as birth doulas have always been around. So it's not that this is anything new, it's that the title is something new. And, um, but, th but the work is very natural. And of course, for as long as there have been living beings, there have been those that serve those that, that are dying. Um, so it's, it's really a beautiful offering. There are, of course, those that we know about that, that serve the, the dying. So people who work in residential care and nursing home facilities, um, and hospice workers. So those are the professions that people understand that, um, care for, the dying and and then a, a different group of professionals care for the dead but the the work of um a death doula is is it kind of weaves in between all of those and can fill in the gaps where those people in those particular professions uh or or careers can't always go so the the a, a birth doula is very similar in like a, a death doula and that it's the ushering in and the ushering out of life. And a lot of times throughout history, it's been the same people that, that do that oftentimes women. Um, and so it's, it's beautiful that it's arising now this um, in this way that, that we need nurturing more than ever. And to bring back the sacredness of the the quiet spaces that happen during the dying process, so it's um, I, I always like to clarify though that it's nothing new. <laughs> it is nothing new. It it's something that is, I guess, always being done, particularly and and oftentimes not by children but by by the children of parents or by people that are taking care of their children that may be passing or different things like that and there are different ways that we have seen so much of life changing in the past few years and on one hand it's this natural sacred beautiful aspect of life as we transition but with some of the things that have occurred in our world both from the healthcare side to uh, the things that we're seeing uh, take place around the world when it comes to war and and even other traumatic events such as as homicide. When we think about death, there's often an associated trauma now that's probably within the psyche or within the physiology of many individuals. Talk a little bit about trauma and dealing with one's own trauma in terms of what we see in the world as someone approaches really stepping into a more sacred way of being with someone as they are transitioning. So that's, you bring up a very important point, which is that with social media, with with the news, the headline news, news that is offering, uh, usually shows us the traumatic deaths that are happening the mass murders um and of course the wars and and those are all extremely unsettling deaths when the majority of deaths that happen here in the united states are actually much slower and much gentler but those are not the ones that make the headline news um and what happens is it, it's further impacted down through the generations, even if they're not reading the headline news, that the the video games and the movies are also violent. 
Um, and so people don't have a taste for or an even a recognizing of how death can be gentle and even welcome. So it has there's this real rift between um our societal understanding of death and what the possibilities of death actually are when death occurs naturally. And, you know, even when death doulas do training, when, um, you know, at one time, the, you nobody needed to do death doula training because it was modeled for you in your home and it was modeled in your community. And so these techniques were passed down through experience, through hands-on learning. But now there are death doula trainings where people can uh, really take the time and the space to intellectually understand the dying process, which is absent from our entire educational system. Um, and then hopefully they also get some of the hands-on experience by um, either by getting clients that they're working with or um, through hospice volunteer training and they become an actual volunteer. A lot of people do the training through their, um, or they want to do the training because they have a loved one that they are currently caring for and they want a community to bond with. But with all of the, the deaths that you were just talking about, it's important that when people do death doula training, that they really examine their own biases and their own traumas because caring for those that are dying it all of your vulnerabilities and um judgments and traumas and fears all arise they all come to the surface and so when people do death doula training it's actually a beautiful opportunity for them to look at these things themselves before they're actively caring for somebody one of the lines that I found to be so powerful in your book was, death nesting is how you live your life now, for it is a greater challenge to have a good death if you've not had a good life. That's a really powerful line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so much of the book, although it's talking about uh, some self-care as you're moving through the process and caring for the one that is in the process of dying, it really is about that reevaluation of self and making these choices to be better mentally, emotionally, energetically, physically, spiritually, so that you are better for the person that you're with. But even more so, like you said, it's about having a good life yourself so that when you reach that end stage, you have that completion as well. Yeah, you know, I, I, that's the most important part of this work for me is <laughs> I live a better life having served people who are dying. I'm able to kind of um, just, just live in a more wakeful, gentle, conscientious way. And anybody who has served the dying, you know, it might not have been the best experience of their life. Some people are thrown into caring for their loved one. Um, but it, it does change you. And, um, you know, it can, it can be a, a really beautiful way of appreciating uh, the very basic, simple experiences of being human. Um, you know, being able to get up and get a glass of water if you'd like to. Um, being able to take a deep breath, having your bowels still working. Like these are really miraculous things that we don't think about. But when you work with those who are dying, you realize what a struggle things become, that it's a really big deal to, to move your bowels or to always have to ask for something or that your wishes, you can't communicate them fully and clearly so that people understand you and, and frustration occurs. So, um, you know, when I work with people who are dying, um, there's, there's only so much that I can help them with because they have had, you know, 20, 30, 60, 90 years life before I 
actually worked with them. And so I prefer, uh, not, not prefer, I just find more value in working with those that um, are actively engaging in life so that they can have a gentler death because there's so much to tend to as somebody to somebody um, who's dying, who has never examined the preciousness of their own life before. It's, it's so interesting that you say that because in having to be so present with two parents that are near 90, that are quite health compromised and doing so much for them, you're right. It slows one down to mm-hmm. really have gratitude for you know, the way that our hands move or just the fact that we can breathe deep or certain things that we possess that often we take for granted. And so that process then becomes this gift for both sides if we stop long enough to even hold that sacredness. And we live in such a busy world. And so often when it comes to caregiving and then other responsibilities that someone has, they might feel rushed or frustrated or as if they have to, you know, they have too much on them that they can't be in the sacredness of that process. Is that what death nesting is to support individuals in learning how to do? Yeah, you know, I I really hope so. I I really hope that you know, the, the slowing down part, I'm even listening to how you're talking right now. And, you know, it's so many of the people that are online and in a, a place of um, knowledge and, and sharing with large groups of people and social media and influencers, they talk so fast. Everything is so fast. The information that they're pumping out is so fast, which is great. That's fine but there is such sacredness to slowing down and you really learn that when you're working with i i love that you're working with your parents and they're both close to or in their 90s and there is a kind of slowing that has to happen just so there can be effective communication and when people slow down which our society does not offer there's there's no opening there's no welcoming to slow down people understand how much grief they're actually carrying and for some reason you know the cynical side of me thinks that you know that's that's the idea that our our society because of the way our economy functions you know people can't slow down otherwise they'll start feeling too much um but there's just such a tremendous amount of of grief that's unprocessed and it's it it can be beautiful it can be this you know sorrow can be a tender and beautiful experience if you have the time and support to really examine it but not when things are moving at such a fast pace then then you end up feeling kind of hollow and forgotten and unseen it's it's so true in my own life, I found that allowing grief to kind of swallow me whole at a certain point really gave me this time to be fully present, to let that unwind a lot of things and decondition, so to speak, much of what I had been carrying. And as I have been with, particularly my mother, I can watch and see almost the wheels turning in her head as if she's trying to process or look at life. And Mm -hmm. in the book, there's a practical side to what needs to be done, the logistics and different things that are conversations that have to happen. But then there's also this side of allowing the person to talk and be there to listen. And so when, when you look at being someone that is the caregiver or is the death doula, Talk about how you balance the practical needs that must be taken care of, as well as the really emotional and spiritual and soulful aspects. Mm -hmm. So this is why it takes a village. (laughs) Um, So, you know, there, it, it, 
a, a really wonderfully supportive environment would have many different people, many different hands, many different hearts, many different minds tending to the one that's dying. And we cannot fill it all. So the medical system simply takes care of the physical body. And they have done that to, to more or less degrees. Um, but that is certainly just one aspect. And sometimes it really helps to be emotionally um, uh, separated from the physical needs that have to be done. So it could be very practical to have um, a nurse assistant, a, a trained death doula who does hands-on care, or a community member who simply comes in and changes the linens and bathes the individual and, um, you know, cleans the tubing or whatever has to be done that that some of those physical aspects are done by one person who feels comfortable with it who may be gifted in that area may very much like it there are people that love to tend to people like uh, uh, physically and then maybe somebody else is a really good listener and they are not busy they're not actively doing things around the room. They're simply there to listen, which is invaluable. And maybe someone else is very good at um, offering another perspective. So if the one dying has a perspective that um, seems frightening to them, which can happen, then somebody can offer another perspective that might be soothing. So taking care of the mental and spiritual and physical, um, it, they sometimes can be the same person, but it it can be different people. And of course, you know, um, a pet loved, you know, beloved fur babies, they can be some of the, um, the physical closeness that the person craves. So it's not always just um, human companionship, but you know, when nature can come close or when an animal can come close, that can be every bit or even more soothing to the one that's dying. They, um, you know, the language that, that they're speaking when someone is actively dying is not a language that we, the living, evil, easily have uh, access to. It's really important to have that community, to have several hands, to have the opportunity to have the respite and do one's own work as they are participating in the service of this sacred activity that's taking place. Talk a little bit about preparing the nest. What do we do to really create that sacred and soft environment that holds an individual that is moving through this transitioning phase? Mm. So this is so beautiful. This is, I, <laughs> I love this idea, but of course I wrote a book on it. So that's not surprising, <laughs> but <laughs> um, it's, it's very different for everyone. And that's why it's so beautiful to ask in advance, um, you know, the, the person that you're tending to, but just as equally as important is think of it for yourself. So there's a very beautiful contemplation, meditation, activity that you can do where you imagine your dying time and what are the things that would come into play, the things that you want to surround you, the things that you want to feel, um, the people that you want to have there or those that you don't want there and really get specific and say, I would like to be in my own bed. I would like the curtains open so the sunlight can come in. I would like this music playing. I would like to have the scent of rose in the room. You know, think of all of the different pleasures that you have in life um, and, and how you might soothe yourself in a way that aids your release from your body. You know, I, I worked with one woman who um, didn't want all of her beloved things around her while she was dying because she felt like it would make her want to stay here. <laughs> mm. And I thought that was so 
precious. Like that, that's, I wouldn't have thought of that before, but that's why it's so important to do this work yourself and also then to inquire about what the other person's desires are because everybody is so very different. Death Nesting, the Heart-Centered Practices of a Death Doula is written primarily with a one-to-one caregiver, care-receiver model in mind. But ideally, a whole village would take part. Just as we might prepare a nest for one about to give birth, so can we lovingly prepare a nest for one who is dying. In this practical and compassionate guide, death doula educator Anne-Marie Capel incorporates ancient and modern techniques, mindfulness practices, and herbal support to show how anyone can care for the dying, whether at home, in hospice, or even in the ICU. She demystifies the dying process <clears throat> in by explaining what the body goes through during end of life and presents practices for emotional soothing and other ways to reduce stress and anxiety during the act of dying process. She provides techniques to physically care for the dying, including methods to assist bedridden individuals. She shares ceremony and energetic boundary guidelines, Reiki, and ancestral support techniques, and herbal care for nourishing and healing on a spirit level. I urge you to check out all of her work. If you're interested in ongoing death doula trainings, visit stardustmeadow.com. That's stardustmeadow.com. You can also go to her website, annemariecapel.com. That is in the show notes. And again, the book is Death Nesting, The Heart-Centered Practices of a Death Doula. We'll be right back with Anne Marie right after these messages. Follow Voice America at Facebook.com forward slash Voice America for juicy updates from your favorite radio shows and podcasts. Have you seen 1111? Do you wonder why certain numbers keep showing up in your life? 11, 111, 22, 33, 444. People all over the world are seeing 1111 and learning the language of universal communication. Subscribe to 1111 Magazine today, www.1111mag.com. 1111 Magazine is a bi-monthly print publication that offers a rich, multi-sensory experience. As you engage with experts and topics of consciousness, become enlightened, empowered, and energized so you live a passionate and authentic life of conscious choices. 1111 Magazine, a daily staple for lifting the mindset, discovering the heart, and stepping into conscious living. 1111 Magazine. Order now at www.1111mag.com. 1111mag.com. Do you want more? More joy, more abundance, more power and presence? How would it feel to have more loving relationships? more empowered community, greater fulfillment, and life purpose? The 1111 Mastermind Community inspires, empowers, guides, and supports transformation. Shift your mind, expand your heart, deepen insights, let go and chart a new course, dream a new dream. The 1111 Mastermind Community is an online portal for personal transformation and soulful expansion. Go to courses.1111mag.com. That's courses.1111mag.com. Change begins with you. Let it be simple, convenient, and transformative. The time is now. Step through the 1111 gateway. Courses.1111mag.com. Live up to your fullest potential. This is the Voice America Empowerment Channel. You are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. Simron is an award-winning author, publisher of 1111 Magazine, powerful speaker of wisdom, and a life mentor. Find out more at imsimron.com. Now, back to 1111 Talk Radio. 
before we get back to Death Nesting and Anne Marie Keppel, I want to mention that there is a recent audiobook that I have been the narrator for that has just released, and I invite you to take a listen to it. So download it from Audible. It is titled Leaving Faith, Finding Meaning by Lynn Renoir, and it's a beautiful memoir about her life, but her opening to spirituality, her opening to the idea of oneness after coming from a very uh, strict and abusive background. It's a beautiful story about self-awareness and self-realization if you're looking for something to listen to. Again, that's Leaving Faith, Finding Meaning. My guest today is Anne-Marie Keppel, and she is a death doula educator and founder of the nonprofit Village Death Care, a nurse assistant, Reiki master, and lifelong meditator. She guides individuals transitioning out of life and assists families with end of life, the end of life journey. The focus is on whole being caregiving for home deaths, but can be implemented into other settings, such as acute care, to create a more holistic experience. Basic physical care for bedridden individuals anecdotal vignettes and glimpses into the world of spirit emphasize the poignancy yet lightheartedness of the dying process. She has many mindfulness practices which are profound and yet simple and can be done by anyone that's new to meditation. You will find out within the book Death Nesting techniques for moving and bathing a bedridden individual, what the body physically undergoes during the dying process, practices for emotional soothing, as well as ceremony and energetic boundary guidelines. She provides supporting the senses through the dying process, herbal care and nourishing and healing on a spirit level, and, importantly, how to talk with children about dying and death. Again, you can find out more by going to stardustmeadow.com. The title of the book, again, is Death Nesting, The Heart-Centered Practices of a Death Doula, and she does conduct ongoing death doula trainings. Welcome back, Anne-Marie. Uh, Thank you. you. Yes, you were talking a bit about preparing the nest at the end of the last segment and how we speak to and listen to individuals as to to what they want. And so often, particularly in the last few years or in the world that we live in, everything uh, has allowed us to get more and more comfortable with distance and virtual living and isolation and separation. So for many individuals that have loved ones that they are far away from, that they perhaps see on video or FaceTime, that have someone else that is caregiving or that is the death doula for that person, what can their role be in this process of sacred nesting? Oh, you know, there are, there are beautiful aspects to that. Um, you know, being able to offer care from a distance, um, being able to now use video, um, FaceTime or um, or a Zoom call and actually have a virtual closeness to your loved one is a very beautiful thing. Um, you know, we we sometimes forget that um, the experience of being far from a, a loved one has always happened with with people who have immigrated to a different country. Um, that there there has always been this distance and so it's not just that this is a recent thing that it ha it has happened throughout time and <clears throat> when that happened long ago when you could write a letter back and forth and it may take months to arrive or it may never get there at all correspondence was delayed and so there was a lot of heartache a lot of praying a lot of unknown if their loved ones even made it to the other country or if somebody was actively dying the message might not get there until the person you know long after they had died so in a lot of ways the technology that we have now is a miracle so that people can can say goodbye to each other can share stories can love each other from a distance and so that is a, a very beautiful aspect and 
it's not a replacement for the physical. And so, as you said, sometimes the the caregivers that are taking care of these individuals are not the family. They're not the loved ones. And they're on a schedule. They're on a clock. They might not have time to really listen to them. And the only time that a lot of people get touched is when they are being brought back and forth to the bathroom or when their undergarments are being changed. And so the the loss of touch is is really devastating. And, you know, sometimes there are oftentimes, unfortunately, people in residential care and nursing facilities, their loved ones don't come to visit or it's so very rare. And, um, you know, and that's one of the things that anybody who volunteers can really take into consideration that, um, you know, if they're a death doula that they offer would you like me to hold your hand? Would, would it feel good for me to hold your hand? Um, or it's offer some kind of touch. Don't just assume, not everybody wants to be touched, but to offer touch and ask if that would feel good or a shoulder rub or a, a head massage um, to get some of that closeness back into the being who feels already very isolated. Um, people who are are you know leaving the earth plane oftentimes feel like a little left out they're leaving while others get to stay and so the absence of touch just adds to that emotional pain all of our senses are very important at that time and i i do believe particularly touch is extremely important because it can become so clinical from the caregiver side if they are helping and leaving and don't have the years of emotional connection with the individual so that touch is vitally important however it can come what about the other senses i know you talk a lot about aromatherapy or you talk about taste and herbs how important are providing outlets for these other senses to have expression uh what is that like? Yeah, those those other senses are are usually not tended to, um, certainly not in in medical facilities. But it's amazing how much it changes the the entire experience. So, you know what what hospitals will do is they make sure that it's a correct temperature. Um, so they will give more blankets or they will give some kind of um, ways for for the person to be to be warmer and that of course is one of the biggest ways to to change the person's experience but there's usually no consideration for lighting um which we all know can be very invasive with a lot of overhead lights and uh with sound also is is something that's usually not considered so uh there are ways that this can be helped. And, you know, I was working in a, um, I, I was caregiving for my my father-in-law in the hospital and we were in a very busy ICU on a very busy night. And one of the nurses came into um, the space and the, the patients were really lined up side by side, but there were curtains that were able to separate between the people. And she said, she didn't just do, she said, I'm going to draw this curtain to create, um, a, a, I don't know if she said a sound space or a private space, something like that. But she actually verbalized it. She didn't just walk by and close the curtain and keep going. She told the person what was being done. And I find that incredibly important. So it, it changes something in the brain that, somebody a cares enough to do that but also that you have um, initiated there a, a cocoon has been activated a safe space a nest has been engaged in a way that helps to protect the person that's in there and efforts like that can be made um you know if you are in a, a hospital and ICU when the staff is not active in the room, uh, turn the lights off. 
(laughs) And, you know, make sure you're not turning any of the equipment off, of course. But there... The, the nursing staff is not going to do it because they have been trained to always leave the lights on. But oftentimes they'll, you know, turn their head if you explain, well, the overhead lights are disturbing this individual. So I would like them off when you're not in here. Um, there, there are ways that, that you can, can work with that. Also, uh, offering headphones. So noise canceling headphones can help keep the space feeling intimate and block out all of the busyness from the rest of the environment. And sometimes that can be helpful even in someone's own home. If the sounds of the home are very active or if there is arguing going on, then uh, noise canceling headphones can really be a savior. You talk about in the book how hearing is the sense that lasts the longest that people can hear far beyond. And so it's really important uh, in regard to what's being said uh, or like arguing or anything like that taking place uh, around the individual. When it comes to the types of conversations that are important, that do need to be heard, what do you advise in terms of conversations if there is a rift, if there is unfinished business, if there is more of a clinical side of just always talking about procedure and what needs to be done and and logistics, what is the conversation that needs to happen and how do you guide someone to begin opening that up? Mm. It's it's a fine line because, um, you know, I am not a family systems therapist. And so it's it's really a fine line. An invitation can be opened, but it it really should be felt from the the people who want to express. And so it can be, you know, a series of questions can be asked and and then let the person come to their own confu- um to their own understanding of what should be said so that you are not adding confusion to an already emotional situation so uncomfortable exchanges do happen and sometimes they need to happen sometimes people need to say things um both the one dying and the caregiver or loved ones Um, in order for them to feel like there's some kind of release that has happened. I don't consider it my responsibility to initiate those conversations. Um, Yet, I will certainly be supportive if they do unfold. And what I try to emphasize is that whatever is said, if at all possible, to have it come from a place of love, So even if you have to tell them that they really harmed you, that you felt, you know, scared as a child and and you want to express that to them because this is your last opportunity to try to express that from a place of love instead of a place of accusation. And I say that not because one would be wrong and the other would be right. It goes way past that. It's much more complex. It's just that the one who is living will, you know, who is not dying will remain living. And those last words, those last exchanges will remain with them. So it's as much of a protection for the one dying as it is for the one who is going to be expressing these um these thoughts, these feelings. And sometimes the uncomfortable things that are said come from the one who is dying. And that's harder to control. They're they're on their way out and what comes out may not be able to be healed. In fact, sometimes what's said is so painful that then those that are remain living have to carry that with them. So these things do happen. It's heartbreaking. We do all have our own wounds and traumas and things that we have carried. And so it is important that we allow that presence 
to what needs to be said or what does not need to be said to allow the space for silence or for the words that are wanting to come. Talk a little bit about what the physical body does during the the dying process. And then if you'll go into a little bit about psychedelics and how that can help soothe the process. Oh, sure. So um, there are some very basic things that that happen with um, uh, it throughout the dying process that that no matter what the traditions are, what the culture is, what the um, economic status is, the race of the individual, the um, just the, the different ways that people have lived there, all of those things will play a role throughout the dying process. But there are some very physical things that everybody does just the same. Um, and that is, you know, an irregular heartbeat, uh, irregular breathing pattern. And, you know, there it's so beautiful because it brings us back to our animal selves, to just the core aliveness, the the human animal experience that we are becomes very apparent during the active dying process, very much like how it becomes very apparent during the birthing process and how, you know, women um, who, you know, sometimes are very quiet or meek might bellow. They might, you know, great big noises and sounds might come from their body. And it's just returning to this, um, the rawness of, of the animal experience and that, you know, the, the loudness, the, the vocalization may not happen during the dying process. Um, but just the same kinds of feelings of, of, um, just this momentous occasion, you can really feel it in the room. You can really feel a a changing, a transition, a, a vortex, an awakening, uh, whether the person is uh, coming into the world or and the person leaving the world, it really feels like an awakening. Um, and sensitive people can really, really tune into that and feel it. And, you know, a, the psych- psychedelic experiences, um, you know, a, a, a few different, a few different things. So while somebody is in their healthy everyday life they can touch upon some of these deafing experiences through psychedelics and they it can be helpful then if you have touched upon a kind of uh, oneness a that that you're so much bigger than your human body that you really feel like that that your energetic field can actually be merging with with nature if you're outside and you're with a tree and you have this intimate moment then when you are going through an active dying process you remember you recall that you are more than just your physical body and so many times you know our reliance upon the medical system and doctors it just perpetuates the idea that we're simply a physical body or a mechanical body or flesh and bone and things can be fixed or they can't be fixed. And obviously we're so incredibly much more than that. And so not that psychedelics are a cure for everything, but they are one medium. They are one way to help, um, break your your conditioning out of that physical body only mentality which is really helpful for uh, those that are dying it really is a process of aliveness in my own trilogy i go into what aliveness really is and it's that full embrace of our humanity the willingness to feel everything and in this type of scenario there's this opening for both the caregiver and the receiver to deepen into the sense of humanity and then to touch, as you have said, that animal part 
which I also have found is so much of who we are to have that aliveness, that we are here to experience and embrace all of it. In looking at that aliveness and truly giving ourselves the full human experience, should the dead attend their own funeral? <laughs> I love that question. Um, yes. You know, when when I work with people, so I, I teach death doulas. I'm a death doula educator and I do lots of public speaking and I have done death cafes before. And people don't have much connection with actual physical dead bodies. And it's amazing if you ask a group of people, um, you know, have you seen a dead body? And very few people actually raise their hand, even some of the older generations, but certainly most of the younger ones. And so it is, um, I think, incredibly important for the dead to attend a funeral. I love the idea of celebrations of life. Truly, I do. And I am full in full support of mourning and being sad at a funeral and grieving with the people who loved the person and having some representation of the form that they have become, whether that is the physical dead body, the corpse, or whether that is cremains, or whether you are fortunate enough to be able to go to an open pyre, but to have the dead present. So for me, um, I, I do feel like it's important. And then later, another time in a year or so, to have a celebration of life is, is also very beautiful. Alil Arthur says, I never would have expected that death would be the thing to bring me back to life. The work of a death doula is a way of life, how they create for others, how they care for themselves, the uncomfortable conversations they allow themselves to engage in, how they confront their own mortality, and how they choose to live their lives. Death doulas want to create and maintain the kind of environment that feels comfortable to die in. This environment could pertain to just the person dying, but can include their family and friends as well. This means getting paperwork in order, creating a schedule that feeds manageable, engaging in difficult conversations, non-judgmentally witnessing emotional unraveling, attending appointments, house cleaning, creating flow in the care area, and lots and lots of listening, among many other things. Not every death doula does all of these things, but some do all of that and more. If you're interested in death doula training, I invite you to visit Anne Marie's website. You can go to stardustmeadow.com and find out more about that. Definitely pick up the book, Death Nesting, The Heart-Centered Practices of a Death Doula. We will all use this information in a variety of ways at some point in our lives, or perhaps you currently are in need of this now. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for being on 1111 Talk Radio. It's been a rich and beautiful conversation. Until next week, I am Simran, in love, of love, with love, and as love. Be well. Thank you for opening your mind to a new reality, your heart to greater compassion, and your experience of aliveness with 1111 Talk Radio. Join host Simron next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern Time to step through the gateway of conscious living here on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Remember, you are not on the journey. You are the journey.